Well, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> we are gathered here this evening, friends and my dear family and brethren. Uh, there's a special bond with all of you here that I have and my wife has, each one of you unique individual, all of you out there connected with us. Um, really appreciate to be able to do this together as part of the body as one body, to celebrate the most solemn occasion, if you will, but yet to me and to us, and you, many of you will get my letter this Friday night, uh, there will be some eyebrows raised. But this evening uh, is solemn, but reflective, but yet so incredibly encouraging. This will be decades for me keeping the Passover, and I'm looking here, most many of you. We're going to see this evening, as we go through the Passover service, we're going to go back through the history, what took place. But when you leave here tonight, I pray that you are praising God, upbeat, positive, and realize just how blessed we are to be able to keep and celebrate this Passover that we're commanded to do so. The event that took place decades ago changed the course of this world. This service, unlike what many teach, begins the plan of God. There would be no plan for you and for me without Jesus Christ dying for everybody. He died for you, and He died for me. He died for every human being that will ever live and ever has lived. It's a memorial tonight of the suffering, murder, and sacrifice of the Son of God, but it is not to be somber or depressing. Passover is most encouraging. We're going to look at Psalm 103 here in just a minute. Because it pictures the love that God has for His people and all mankind. And the glorious victory over sin and death that we have because Christ said He yearned, if you remember, to take that Passover and with you and me, friends. In Psalm 103, and you don't need to follow along unless you want to, Psalm 103 and verse 1 Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of His benefits. Who forgives all our iniquities. Who heals all our diseases. I hope you heard that, Victoria. God can. But it's according to His will. I know Victoria is connected with us. That's why I can speak of her as she suffers. And we're with you in spirit. He redeems our life from destruction, who crowns with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies our mouths with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I'm looking across this room, and I'm sorry, folks, but oh, what I would give to have my youth renewed like an eagle, with all our aches and pains and fixes and struggles. You're going to be able to do the high jump again someday, Helen. If you never did it, well, you're going to learn. Maybe pole vault, I don't know, whatever you want to do. The Lord executes righteous and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known His ways unto Moses, His acts unto the children of Israel. Again, verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us after our sins, rewarding us according to our lawlessness. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear and love Him. As far as east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. In other words, it's infinite. And each member of the body must partake of the sacred ordinance of Passover every year to reaffirm and renew his or her covenant that you made at baptism. Total submission to God's will. That's the million dollar challenge, isn't it? For all of us. 
to the point of death. In return for the absolute assurance of his forgiveness, acceptance, and what? Eternal life. There's another life coming, Helen. Diddy, Martha, Donna, Bruce. I mean, we're all, we were talking about this today. We're definitely not the heroes of this world physically. Tonight we call to mind this night of infamy, the worst crime ever committed that was caused by our sins, yours and mine. It's important for us to recognize, acknowledge our own individual responsibility for the death of our Lord and Savior. But it was also a night of glory in that the New Testament Passover covenant was instituted. Our guarantee of what? Eternal life. And not these bodies and not how we feel now and how we think and we get tired and we hurt. And things don't work right as we get older, right? I remember my first assignment, Tampa, Florida, 1984. 65% of the congregation was 65 or older. When you're 23 years old, that's old. And we'd visit people and they would tell us about all the different challenges they faced and their doctor's appointment and if their plumbing was working or not. And I used to say to myself, how can you get like this? Here we are. <laughs> but that's not permanent. Thank God for that. There's going to be a time when you quit tripping. And I don't mean tripping because you're tripping, but tripping. <laughs> Stumbling. Maybe that's a better word. We're renewing our commitment to let Christ live in us. So I want to take a few minutes to look at the self-examination. I know you've all done this. When we take the Passover, what I enjoyed about this evening as we sat here and fellowshiped and talked, it's like the family is back together. This is how we have what we have at the feast. We all get together from traveling all over, right, Jan? And we're here, and it's like, there's a buzz and there's a positiveness, and that's what I want you to leave with tonight. Okay, we're going to talk about some things that are very sobering, but I want you to leave, and I want your tail between your legs and your head down, and oh, don't talk to anybody. I don't want that because that's not what God wanted. And I know this is going to be, I'm raising eyebrows right now. I can just sense it. So be it. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 30 in verse 23, he says, I received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you, the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. In verse 24, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had finished with that, he said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. And he drank it. And he said, and This you do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. The Passover is the memorial of the death of Jesus Christ. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink it in an unworthily manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And I fear that some are in that category. I pray we're not. The term unworthily refers to an attitude that is unworthy the Phillips translation says, without proper reverence, taking it for granted. Oh, yeah. Taking it for granted. Putting other things in a higher priority than one's relationship with God, which is breaking the first commandment. Whatever that is that you and I put before God needs to be examined. Let a man, verse 28, examine himself, and then let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And that when it says man, it means men and women. It doesn't just mean men, of course. And I want to read verse 29 and 30. Let me go over there. I was reading from my notes. Bear with me here a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> and verse 29. For he that eats and drinks in an unworthy manner drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 
Part of that is discerning the Lord's body, our Lord. The other part is the body. We are the body of Christ and many others. Many claim to be, yet they don't talk to one another. You left the church. You're not part of the body. Only we're the true body, right? That's abominable. And that is not of God. That's what Scripture is clear. If you don't examine and drink You're not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak. Asenio means, Helen, what you suffer, without strength. Okay? And sickly, another word, among you, and many have died. Why? I want to comment on this. For if we judge ourselves, verse 31, we should not be judged. Paul was teaching the Corinthians about our covenant with God and our need to examine is whether we are treating this calling and relationship with seriousness and respect, but also how we look at others. Some have become so discouraged and doubted they should even take the Passover. Oh, I'm weak. I lack faith. I'm not worthy. One of our adversary strategies is to isolate any of us, one of God's children, a sheep, from the flock, cut him or her off from the source of spiritual food, The bread of life. I have no authority as a servant of God to say who and who can't be part of the body. They're not mine. But yet, some of us in our arrogance have crossed over that line and separated and made, decided who can and who can't. That's frightening to me. Passover is the greatest way to build or rebuild your faith, your attitude, your spiritual strength. Christ renews His covenant. He reconfirms His promise to work with us, provide, lead, guide, sustain, inspire, help, encourage us just for the start. I don't know about you, but in the last, pick a number, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, has it been more of a challenge to hold on to that relationship with God than ever before it has for me? hope that doesn't shock you. For all kinds of reasons. And it's not letting up. Anybody feel that pressure just going away and everything's fine? From multiple fronts. He tells us in the Old Testament and the New Testament, in Hebrews 13, 5, the New, Joshua 1, 5, and the Old, I will never leave you or forsake you. And there have been times where I've said, God, you promised not to to throw me under the bus. (laughs) And I go and I read that scripture to remind him like he needs reminded, but I need to make sure, you know. We should see our inadequacies and sinfulness, but also our importance and value to God. When we look at ourselves, we should not view ourselves, what? All alone, but standing with God Examination shows we are unworthy but not worthless. Christ became as the sinner in our place, so he considered us to be worthy because we accept him, a sinless member of the body of God's family. Let's go to Luke chapter 22 as we finish this examination discussion a little bit here. <coughs> Luke chapter 22, and I, I don't want to go really long tonight, but I do need to cover a few things. We can't just skim and give it a lick and a promise. We need to go through it. Luke chapter 22 and verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare us the Passover we may eat. And he said unto them, Where will you that we prepare? And he said, Behold, when you enter into the city, you shall a man shall meet you bearing a pitcher of water, follow him to the house where he enters. You shall say to the The goodman of the house, the master said, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover? I talk about this in my Friday night letter coming out this Friday. He shall show you a large upper room furnished. Make it ready. And they went and they found and said, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with Desire, I have desired to eat this Passover and with you before 
I suffer. That we reflect about it, we think about what took place with him, the disciples, and what was Christ thinking and pondering and realizing what he was going to have to go through. Let's move now into what we call the foot washing service. I want to go through several things here. In Philippians chapter 2, and I'll just refer to some of these, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we are to esteem each other better than ourselves. How many times, Jan, have I said this before the Bible basics with our comments? To edify and esteem each other better than ourselves. That's important. That's what, as we're talking about the foot washing, is all about. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, <laughs> I love this, and I go through it every year I have for decades because it's so poignant and so profound, and yet we, some of, we just read right over it. Here, concerning widows, in verse 9 of 1 Timothy 5, Paul says, Let not a widow be taken under the number under threescore years, so this special group under 60, having been the wife of one man, well reported of her good works for her good works. And I get embarrassed when I put my name in here and say, okay, is this, have I done these things? If she has brought up children, I love that, let's translate it. If she has survived raising kids, we get a kick out of connecting with my two grandchildren and my daughter and son-in-law watching him go through it, which most of us have been through that with ours. If she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted and has diligently followed every good work. And if you read several commentaries in the history, it's talking about this concept of washing feet is not just once a year at the Passover, it reminds us we need to be doing this regularly. What I mean by that is you don't wash feet every Sabbath or every once a week. It's the attitude of service. Being willing to go way out of your way to pick someone up. To help someone who has difficulty walking. To be there to help and encourage others when they suffer. I'm going to say this, and I mean it with all sincerity to everybody in this room. All of you have been a huge encouragement to my wife and me multiple times over. Every one of you. That's special for us. And hopefully we've done that for you. I haven't done that for everybody, as I've been told. <laughs> but we, through that process, understand I once said to someone, it is never convenient to go visit someone when they're not feeling well or take them food or give somebody a ride. It's never convenient. Funerals, I have never had someone call, okay, when's a good time for me to die for my funeral? I'm sick, so when would be a good time that would fit your schedule? I think we could all fill in the blanks. Let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, <clears throat> and verse 1, and we're going to read quite a few verses here, but it's important, or I wouldn't do it. Now, before the feast of the Passover, and, well, let's just, I won't, I'll try not to say too much, just read it. When Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto his Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them until the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things to his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments. You know, so some call it this, the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. I'm not going to start straining at gnats and swallow camels and say, no, you have to call it the Passover service. If you want to call this the Lord's Supper, that's between you and God. I'm not going to get all wigged out about that. Some would. I won't. And so, 
He rose from that meal, and he laid aside his garments, and he took a towel, and he wrapped it around his waist. And he poured water in the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Did you read that? He used his towel on someone's nasty feet. Use their towel. No, he used his towel. Because they didn't have a Maytag laundry washing machine back then. And he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus Christ said unto him, what, you, what I do now, you don't know, but you will know afterwards. And Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. There's old Peter. You ain't washing my feet. Jesus answered and said, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. When Jesus Christ knew that his hour was come, he was committed to the end. And we need to have that same commitment toward him and each other. And each other. Christ is willing to unconditionally love and serve you and me. He commands what we follow his example and humble ourselves as well. So we continue. When Peter said, you shall never wash my feet, in verse 8, okay, when he said, no. He said, if you don't, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. We have no part with Christ if we aren't spiritually cleansed by him. He tells us to follow his example of physically washing each other's feet. In a ceremony is a symbol of our willingness to serve him and each other. There are certain physical exceptions, sickness, taking the Passover by yourself, but there are no spiritual exceptions. We have absolutely no part in Christ if we aren't cleansed by him, giving his attitude of desiring what? He who is greatest among you, let him be your servant. Oh, I so much don't have time for the, the ministries up here, and the brethren are down here, as I was told in this very house by the leadership of somebody where I used to be. You're up here, and all the brethren are down here. I almost vomited, shook my head. I hope some folks repent, because that is not the Spirit of God. Through the process of serving each other, we are washed. To knowingly refuse to follow him in this physical ceremony would also indicate an attitude toward what? Me toward you, maybe, but toward God. Let's continue John 13, verse 9. Peter said, not only my feet, then my hands and my head. And Jesus said, he that washed needs not save wash his feet, but is clean every whit. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. After he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and was set down, he said unto them, Christ was wonderful with this. Uh, do you know what I just did to you? Hello? They said, right? You call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. But if I then, your Lord and master, Christ said, have washed your feet, you also should wash each other's feet. For I have given you this example that you should do as I have done to you. So how can you say it's not important to wash feet for this service? It doesn't really matter. You don't have to do that. I, maybe i not the smartest pencil in the stack, but I can read and understand what I read. Truly I say unto you, Listen to this. Would this not change the body of Christ if we read this? The servant is not greater than his Lord, he, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy, joyful, if you do them. I remember one time, and if this individual's watching, forgive me. But I remember 
in the enthusiastic approach to the foot washing, I had just gotten my shoe off and the person grabbed my foot and shoved it in the water, sock and all. I said, it's okay, and we laughed. I said, it's okay. You know, rug it out, put it back on, and squish, squish, squish. I thought, well, I might as well get the other one too. So it was hot, so I put it in the other one, both of them. You know? I wasn't offended. We laughed because it was funny. Some of you may not find that funny. I'm sorry, but life's too short to not realize life is life. But it's a life of service to give way that yields happiness. I remember one of you sitting here, which I'm not going to look at any of you, one of you sitting here, I could not figure out how to get the light bulb to quit breaking in my bathroom. And you said, make sure the power's off, and reached up in there and bent something, and said, there you go. I'm like, wow, that was easy. You know, I've lived here all these many months and couldn't figure it out. In fact, my whole life, I never had to get a bulb. So I said, note to self, make sure the power's off before you stick something up in the light socket. Right? Simple little thing. But when we serve and help each other, it doesn't have to be some dramatic, huge thing. You know? A simple thing. And we forget that in this crazy life. So, we will now have a short break and the video will uh, wait until we come back. So, don't disconnect. You need to go do your foot washing and, huh? I didn't hear you. Still can't hear it. So, anyway, I don't have my hearing aids in. Sorry. We'll now have the foot washing service and we'll be back in five to ten minutes or a little more. Uh, the women will go this direction, and the men will go that. Neither of the two shall meet. If they happen to meet, it's okay. But So uh, we'll take a break and do that, and then we'll be back to continue with the Passover service.
to Isaiah chapter 53. In verse 3, It says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid it as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs. That Hebrew word, diseases, twisted bodies, and carried our sorrows. The Hebrew, that means sickness. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, which means to depress, abase, chastise, and humble. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him <coughs> the iniquities of us all. And verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he put him to grief. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, <coughs> and he shall divide that spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul into death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. In Matthew chapter 8, go over to Matthew chapter 8, please. Verse 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with demons. And he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick. Verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself, took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy taken upon him the penalty of sin by personally using his power to heal all who were sick was further proof of the cleansing power of his forthcoming sacrifice. In 1 Peter chapter 2, if you'd go with me there, please. 1 Peter chapter 2. Again, not covering all the scriptures, but I don't want to just skim over some things that are really important. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. This context of chapter 2 refers to an attitude of having love toward others. You know, the Bible says, in the end time, many shall run to and fro, and the love of many shall wax cold. That's not just talking about the world. It's talking about the body of Christ as well. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 for what glory is it if when you are, the Greek here, buffeted means to be struck with a fist for your faults. You take it patiently. But when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. And it's interesting, this word acceptable here is the Greek word charos or charos, which is grace. That is the grace of from God, when we take it patiently. For hereunto were you and I called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. That's why you and I and we suffer. We're following his example. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. That guile meaning a cutting craftiness, manipulating. Do we see that happening today anywhere? No guile was found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, 
He didn't revile again. Oh, yeah. Well, how about that? What do you think of that? There, I got you back. That's not God's mind. That's carnality. That's humanness. That's wrong. That's sin. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He committed himself to him that judges righteously. To his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live into righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. It is very easy today for me. All I have to do is drive in the world. I could go up to Publix or down to the post office, wherever I go. Fairhope, Daphne, Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, Foley, Babinette, doesn't matter. Invariably, every trip I take, there's somebody that it's all about them. And if you're not careful, you will fall into this, I'll tell you what, buddy, you know. What does God say to do? There's a spiritual approach to the healing. We don't just need the physical healing. We need the heart and the mind, the head healed from thinking like the world does. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Seeing then we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christ's sacrifice was for the healing of our mind and our heart and our body. It was given so that we could have our sins forgiven and be reconciled to the Father. We cannot put sin out without Christ. We can't do it. And you cannot overcome without God. You can try, but you can't. Let's talk about the bread before we partake of that part. Luke records the institution of the New Testament Passover symbols in chapter 22, in verse 14 to 15 and verse 19, where he said, He took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do you in remembrance of me. Jesus instructed his disciples to eat some unleavened bread, which symbolizes his broken body. Let's now notice John's discourse on the bread of life recorded in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and let's begin about verse 32. Then Jesus said, Truly I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father gave you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that he which comes down from heaven and gives his life unto the world. And he said unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes on me never thirst. They're so profound. Verse 40, let, let's continue here. Let's go through to verse 40. He said unto you, you have also seen me and believe not. All the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to you I will no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's why I tell and I share and I look in the mirror and I say, we must learn to accept and do the will of God because generally the will of God is not our will. And we want God's will to match our will. But he says, it doesn't work that way. It is the Father's will which has sent me that all which have given me I should lose no one, but should raise him up again in the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Go down to verse 48. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness, and they're dead. 
This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And that bread I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Down to verse 53. Then Jesus said, Truly I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, symbolic of the bread and the wine, you have no life in you. Who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up that last day. For my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, I live by the Father. So he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat and are dead, but he that eats of this bread shall live forever. So the key in verse 57 is living by him, an attitude, a mind of Christ, obedience to his laws, the works of Christ. In verse 63, he said, it is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. Are we beginning to understand the flesh profits nothing? You learn that as you age and fall apart. Or as Paul said, it profits body, bodily exercise profits for a little while. It doesn't last. It's the spirit that quickens. And the words he speaks unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Words refer to the way of life taught in the Bible summary, the attitude, the actions of Jesus Christ. The symbolism is of a complete and total commitment to God the Father through Christ, willing to do whatever it is and to be found so doing. And the hardest part is when it hurts and it doesn't work and it's not fun, isn't it? Paul expands the meaning of the broken unleavened bread in 1 Corinthians 10. Verses 16 to 17, the cup of the blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body? For we being many are one bread, one body. One body doesn't mean you'll have to be under one corporate ladder with one president, one council, or one whatever, presiding evangelist or apostle or grand pupa, whatever you want to call him. He has placed us in the body as it pleases him. We are all partakers, though, of the body of that one bread. Christ is not divided. How many years? I have been doing this over six decades. How many years will it be before man can get it through his hard head? What we keep trying to do ain't working. But we don't give up, do we? The small piece of broken bread that we're going to eat here shortly symbolizes the scourging Christ endured for our sins. So all the evil results, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, of those sins will be removed. With the barriers of sin removed, we are welcomed into fellowship with Christ. Another aspect of the bread is we become one body. We all partake of that bread of life. In this tray, I'm about ready to break this bread I don't say, okay, that piece is for you, Kim. You can't have that, daughter. That's yours, daughter. I put names on all of them. Then I mix them all up to mess with you. No, it doesn't matter. We have fellowship with Christ and each other as members of the body. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord came the same night which he betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. When I break it, I would like you, if you could hear, listen. The bread is symbolic of Christ's suffering in our place for our sins. Our deserved punishment for guilt fell upon Jesus Christ. It is symbolic of Christ living in us. John 6 and Matthew 4 talk about our need to live by every word of God. The scourging that Christ endured, also for the healing of our illness. Isaiah chapter 53 talks about Matthew chapter 8. By partaking of this broken bread, 
We share this meal with Christ and each other and picture coming once again into the unity of mind and heart. There's another symbol which ties in with the bread. And this is what I want as part of us to leave with tonight. The unleavened bread is symbolic of the wonderful and pure life of Christ living in us and our need to live by every word of God. The foot washing is also a pleasant thing, especially when the water's cold. Right? A life of service yields a profoundly sweet life of both giving and receiving. And sometimes it's really easy to give, but it's hard to receive, isn't it? If you've been one that always buys everybody's meal, takes everybody out, always does stuff for people, and then you're placed in a position where you can't, they have to do it for you, sometimes we don't want to do that. Because, well, I don't, you know, I don't need help. I got this. And you learn through the process, we need each other, don't we? I'm going to ask a prayer over the bread before we pass this out. I'll pray over it, then I'll break it. You just bow your heads. I'm going to sit down because I can't stand very well tonight. My knee is bothering me. I'm sorry. Our Father in heaven, God, thank you for what this night symbolizes. Thank you for what this bread symbolizes. Thank you for your love and your mercy toward us. Please bless this bread as a symbol of Christ's body broken. We give you thanks that Christ suffered. None of us can imagine what it was like what he went through. We pray for the strength and power of the Holy Spirit to help us to suffer for righteousness' sake as Christ did. And as members of the body of Christ, that you would give us and bless us with the attitude of love and service and wisdom to apply in our lives. Give us a profound and deeper understanding, Father, of the principles spiritually that we're covering this evening. And please help us to be unified not just as a congregation, a little one here, but the body of Christ in spirit, in truth. And Father, we thank you for what this bread symbolizes as we partake of it. Help us to reflect on as we chew on this piece and truly thankful that we could eat symbolically of that true bread that came and gave his life for us. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 27, and he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, here, drink you all of this, for this is the blood, my blood of the New Testament or covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 to 9, if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from the all unrighteousness. In the Old Testament sacrifice, blood symbolically cleansed sin and impurity. The body was eaten. It nourished the one who was cleansed. So the shepherd both cleanses and feeds his flock. The believer is cleansed so he may have fellowship with God and be fed and given life. These symbols are inseparable, as is the sacrifice. They must be taken together to be acceptable to God. 
Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, if you would, please. Hebrews chapter 9. And we'll begin in verse 11. By Christ being come to the high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified of the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the new covenant. And by means of death, redemption and transgression were under the first covenant, that which are called might receive the promise of not temporary but eternal inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. If you go there, please. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his own blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the richness of his grace. In the Romans chapter 3, we know this by heart, most of us do. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 26. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace and redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a go-between, that's what propitiation means, through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past to the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness that He might be just and the justified of Him which believes in Christ." The brethren, our sins, the transgression of God's holy and righteous law, caused the death of Jesus Christ. He died in our stead. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 3, it says, He died for our sins, your and mine, according to the Scripture. He paid that penalty for us. As we partake of this wine symbolizing your acceptance of the blood of Jesus Christ for the mission of your sins. Think about, if you would, what we're doing. I'm going to pray over it first. Holy Father, again, we come before you. Thank you for what this wine symbolizes through the death and the blood shed as that spear was thrust in through the cardio sac and pierced and killed him and he died. He didn't die of a broken heart. He died from that horrible beating and then the blood pouring out, unable to recirculate to keep life. We give you thanks for redeeming us from death. God, please bless this wine to its sacred use as the symbol of Christ's blood and shed for the remission of sin. Thank you for giving your only Son to die for us, washing us clean that we might be reconciled to you. Thank you, God, for your willingness, for Jesus Christ's willingness to submit to your will, even unto death. And help us to have even a greater understanding of the spiritual application of what that blood that poured out. We remember he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he knew that had to be done. His blood had to be spilled out. He had to die for us to be reconciled to you. Help us to work on, as we go through this next year, Father, reconciling not only continually through you with Jesus Christ living in us as a go-between and that wonderful blessing, but with each other to ponder, meditate, muse, and contemplate and think and reflect on this calling. Father, time is an 
relative terms very short. Any of us, some of us may not be here next year. God be with us, help us to be at peace with you through Jesus Christ, with him and with one another. So we ask this, we thank you, we praise you and love you when we do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. could follow along or just listen, whichever. I have a few scriptures I would like to read. So if we go together in John, in John chapter 13, it will be looking at various scriptures through John 13 through John 17, beginning in John 13 verse 31. Therefore, when Judas was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. Verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you. See, it was new to the disciples and application in their lives. That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my students if you have love one for another. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. It is in my Father's house are many, you know, the temple. There are many mansions, positions of authority. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive unto you myself that where I am, you may be also. Whether I go now, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Think about this. Jesus then said, I am, one of the seven I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. If you had known me, you would have also known my Father, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Verse 12, truly I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that he shall do, and the greater works than these things shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. That is Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Would he die on the cross and then say, you don't need to worry about that anymore? Chapter 14 and verse 15. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. That's the word parakletos in Greek. That it may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it sees the spirit not, neither knows it. But you know it, and I'm reading as it should be, not italicized. That was changed. For it dwells with you and shall be in you. And I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you a little while, and the world sees me no more, but you shall see me, because I live, you shall live also. And that day, interestingly, Pentecost, you shall know that I am my Father, and I in me, and I in you. He that keeps my commandments and keeps them as he is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and will love him, and will manifest myself. Judas said, not Iscariot, so the different well, Judas, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us and not in the world? And he said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. 
Matthew 4.4. 4. Luke 4.4, 4. and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our, our bone with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, it shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance. And I might add, as you age, gradually. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace coming through that Holy Spirit. I leave with you my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Folks, stop fussing and worrying. God's got this. You're going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. It's part of the experience temporary physical existence. Christ said he suffered, we would as well. But don't be troubled. Don't lay awake at night, oh, I read on CNN, I heard on CNN, oh, bad storms coming, oh, the economy, oh, the election, oh. Boom, 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 get up, got to have a stiff drink. <coughs> Which is actually not a, it's actually a stimulant. So it's a false sense of feeling Relaxed. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again. If you love me, you would rejoice. Did you hear that? If you love me, you will rejoice. Because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than me, and I have told you before it comes to pass. That when it comes to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. Satan would come in the person of Judas. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so do I. Stand up and let us go hence. Continue in John chapter 15, verse 1. I am, here's another one of those seven I am's. I am the true vine, and my Father is the wine dresser, excuse me, vine dresser. Every branch of me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears not fruit, he purges it. And it may bring forth more fruit. Every year we cut our crepe myrtles back so far, I'm like, they ain't going to make it. And every year they come out bigger and bigger and better. When we're purged and pruned, it hurts, doesn't it? It stinks. We don't like it, and we let God know. And he says, if I don't do that, you're not going to grow. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine. He repeats it. You are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Do you know what pure religion is? Giving sermonettes, as they call it, or short messages, or messages at the Feast of Tabernacles, Rich. No, pure religion is what? To visit the widows and the fatherless in their affliction and keep oneself unspotted from this world. We forget, don't we? Greater love has no man that he lays down his life for his friends. If a man abides not in me, he casts forth as a branch, withered, men gather, and cast in the fire, and burn. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. You can't just coast along and say, I'm okay. It's active. You need to pray, Father, give me opportunities. Prune me. Please be careful. Don't get the loppers out. Just use the little tiny things. Take little things off. But give me opportunity to grow and serve and help others and get my mind off myself. Here it is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. The Father loved me, and I have loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And even as I have kept the Father's commandments, then abide in His love. These things I have spoken, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. 
That's why the Passover needs to be upbeat. For how many decades has it beat us down? Oh, oh, horrible. Yes, it's sobering what Jesus Christ did. But here he's talking to them. He says, these things have I spoken that you might, my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than the man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I don't call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his Lord does, but I call you friends. I once in a prayer said to Father, thank you that Jesus Christ, our elder brother and our friend, they said, you can't say that. That's disrespectful. Sorry, I read scripture again. I get in trouble when I do that. I have called you friends for all things I have heard of my Father. I have made known unto you. He shares with us. That's why I believe in being transparent, not with confidential information. But what are we afraid of? Why do we have to hide everything? Well, this is only for the special elite group. Don't share this with anyone now. Because we're special. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And your day you should go and bring forth fruit, and your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you ask of my Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command, that you love one another. He keeps saying this over and over. You know why? Because we don't. We say, oh, I love you. You ever been through that? Oh, I love you, brother, my friend. Then they stab you in the back. The world hates you, that you will know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's why you can't get your permits. They'll like you, probably. They're like, eh, who cares? Right? That's why they don't like you sometimes. Because you don't play by their rules and live that way and do what they do. Remember the word that I said, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If you have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they do not know him that sent me. They think they're doing the will of God. If I had not come and spoken, they had not had sin. He showed what it was. And he represented it when he was crucified. But now they have no cloak for their sin, no excuse, no cover-up. He that hates me hates my father also. If I have not done among them the works which no other man did, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. But this comes to pass that the world might be fulfilled. The word might be fulfilled, written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Paracletus, the comforters, come, whom I send unto you, the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, it shall testify of me. That's why there's so much deception and lying in the world and unfortunately within the church. It's not the Spirit of truth. And if you're connected to God, you will discern that. And you'll say, oh, remember the spidey sense? <laughs> Something's not copacetic here. Something just don't jive. Something's not right. And you shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Let's go to John chapter 16. Begin at verse 12. I have yet so many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them right now. Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth comes, it will guide you into all truth, for it shall not speak of itself, but whatsoever it shall hear, that shall it speak. It will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you all things the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you a little while, and you shall not see me. And again a little while, and you shall see me. That had to blow their minds. You know, the hokey pokey. Here I am, now I'm not. Here I am. What is he talking about? Go down to verse 32. 
Behold, the hour comes, yes, now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own. And shall leave. Are we not scattered now more than we've ever been? I know some of you online are in Guatemala, in Colombia, in the Pacific Northwest, in the Panhandle of Florida, New York, the Midwest. You're scattered all over. Some of you don't have anybody around you for hundreds of miles. And every week you connect on the webcast, thankfully, me or others, I don't care. As long as you get fed the truth. Because you're not together. We're scattered. Yet we are one. We are one body. And verse 33. Every, or every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I have spoken unto you, that you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. That's what we're doing at the Passover. I hope when you leave, when we're finished, you're of good cheer. Please, that you're of joyful. He says, I have overcome the world. We're scattered, but we've overcome the world. And finally, I want to read before we have a hymn, John chapter 17. I want to read the entire verse, the entire chapter. I do this every year. I've done it as long as I can remember. The final prayer, the real Lord's prayer, the night before His crucifixion. Notice the focus. These words spoke Jesus. He lifted up His eyes to heaven because He knew where God's throne was. Then he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. And you have given him power over all flesh, that you should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God of Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify you me with your own self, with the glory which I had before the world was the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, John chapter 1. I have manifested your name unto the men which you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your Word. How many of us have said, this is my flock, these are my elders, my deacons, my brethren, my church. They don't belong to any of us. They're gods and Jesus Christ. Oh, there's so many things we got to tap our heads and say, are we going to get it? Read the scripture. In vain do we worship him, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are of you, for I have given unto them the words which you gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely I came from you, and they have believed that you did send me. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world. The perspective which you have given me, for they are mine, and all mine are thine, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. That you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except Judas Iscariot, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. I want us to notice verse 13. I write about this in my letter, which you'll get Friday. And now I come to you, Father, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Did we read that? I have given them your word. But the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even I as am not of this world. I pray that you should keep take them out, you should not take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I pray for each and every one of you that I know are hooked and connected every week. And those of you here, often, 
Arthur, are you okay? All right. I pray for all of you often and say, God, please protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even I am not of the world. Sanctify them, set them apart through your truth. Your word is truth. And you have set me in the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. And for the sakes I sanctify myself, they also might be sanctified through the truth. The truth is what sets us apart. We're not any better but the truth sets us apart. Neither do I pray for those of the eye for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I gave them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. The world may know that you have sent me and has loved me and you have loved me. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, on that spiritual plane. That's fundamental that we understand that. We need to be at that same place. The only way is through Jesus Christ living in us. That they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have... And these have known that you did send me. And I have declared unto them your name. And I will declare it. And the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them. And I in them. In Mark chapter 14, when they had sung a hymn, they then went out from the Mount of Olives. Following Christ's example, we will now sing a hymn. After we finish singing the hymn, that will conclude the service. So I will now lead us in a hymn. Uh, it is entitled, The Church is One Foundation. And after we finish with singing this hymn, that will conclude this year, 2023, annual memorial service of the suffering and the death and the joy that is possible because of Him dying for you and me of Jesus Christ. May God bless you. May God bless you. May God bless you. <laughs> and may you have a peaceful, restful evening, and we'll see all of you that are able tomorrow evening and all of you online. May God bless and keep you and be with you and have a very inspiring night to be observed and first day of Unleavened Bread.
Good night.